welcome to the Educause Rising Voices podcast, where we amplify the voices of young professionals. My name is Sarah, and I'm joined by my co-host, Wes Johnson. And we're part of the Educause Young Advisory Committee, and we're your co-hosts of the show. To kick us off, we are so excited today to talk about a topic that has been very apropos for young professionals, especially given the show's recent hiatus because of spring break and other scheduling challenges. We're talking about young professionals under pressure today. And we're joined by two fabulous guests, Leslie Majeko and Sharon Andrus. So before we kick off, I'd like to welcome our guests and ask each of you to introduce yourselves. Please give us your name, a brief intro, your position, institution, and what do you think your superpower is? Leslie, kick us off. <laughs> okay, sure. Uh, my name's Leslie Mojako. I'm an instructional designer at the University of Florida. I've been in higher ed for about 15 years, and I'm the chair of the Young Professional Advisory Committee right now. Um, superpower, uh, I would say probably curiosity. I am just so fascinated by the world around me and I constantly am amazed at how much I don't know. And so I'm like eating up every book I read and amazed at the history and the science that I wasn't taught growing up. And just, um, I think Sarah, you know this, I get Snapple facts delivered to my phone every day because <laughs> I just am fascinated by this world. So I, I would definitely say that's my superpower. I love that. And yes, I yeah. do know that. <laughs> yeah, I talk about it. <laughs> you do. Thank you, Leslie. Uh, Sharon, please introduce yourself. Yes. Good morning. Uh, Sharon Andrus. I am the Associate Chief Information Security Officer at the University of California, Berkeley, also known as Cal, for those who don't know that they're one and the same. Um, <laughs> and it's funny, my superpower, uh, for a long time, I would tell people my superpower was like getting things done. Like if you gave it to me, we're gonna get it done. You know, we're gonna get it over the finish line, even if it was on fire when you gave it to me. But in the last couple of years, I've kind of changed um, my thoughts about that. It's like, yeah, that's something I do. But is that really my superpower? And so I think for me, it's really people. Um, my superpower mm -hmm. is connecting people. It's understanding what people are going through. People love to talk to me, tell me their problems, which is really interesting as a slightly introverted person because it's like stranger danger, but <laughs> people are just drawn to me. And so I think that my superpower is all the things, people, and how we work together and how we bring forward our humanity and in, in our work, in our day-to-day -day work. You know. yeah. I love That's wonderful. <laughs> yeah. I love that we have some amazing superpowers on this show today. Thank you all. <laughs> so before we dive in, I want to set a little bit of context for this episode and what we're discussing today. Um, this really started actually with a conversation between Leslie and I. However, Wes, many of us in the Young Professionals Advisory Committee and beyond have kind of been talking about this topic of just feeling under pressure. But what does that really mean? And how do we talk about it more openly, honestly, and with more vulnerability? Um, in preparing for this episode, I did a little bit of research. So I'm going to read some of these facts that I found that I want to share and maybe set the stage for some of our conversations. Um, but I found a study by Bain and Company, which found that an increasing number of millennials and Gen Z workers, 61% exactly, are more stressed and overwhelmed and in danger of burnout at work compared to 40% of those who are 35 and above. And what are they most worried about? According to this study, they're most worried about finances, job security, and failing to meet their career goals in, in the next 10 years. And I think all of us, I get the goosebumps when I say that because I think so many of us right now are kind of in the thick of it, right, with our careers. We are right in that point where things are ramping up where we're really trying our best to set the stage for the rest of our lives. And this episode is not to say that folks who are above 35 or above 40 or even below that aren't feeling that. It's really meant to just give us credence and a voice to talk about some of the unique stressors that young professionals are experiencing for today. So with that, I'm going to kick us off into our first question, just out of curiosity, just to kind of get things going. But I'm curious from, you know, maybe I'll have... Sharon, go first. You know, many young professionals really struggle 
with what we've just described and all of these demands of life and these stressors. And it's hard to say no to things when we're really trying to set ourselves up for success. So could you maybe share with us a time where you felt pressured maybe to say yes to everything and how you eventually established boundaries or how you say no and how you really manage this pressure effectively? Yeah, absolutely. It's it's such an interesting thing because I'm on the 35 and above. <laughs> I'm the 45 and above. I'm like really above. Um, but I do, I definitely relate, you know, as someone, we were all at some point young professionals. Wes and I had that conversation. I was like, I'm not a young professional. He's like, well, at one point you were. And I was like, I can, I can go back to that. Um, but I think for me, um, as a black woman, um, as a woman who comes from a family that is very much about like, you're going to go and do more than the, the previous generation. And like, there's those expectations. I think something I learned very early was that if opportunities were presented, you take them because you don't know if those opportunities are going to come back around your way. Like that, it's not guaranteed. And so I think I came into my career um, very much with that kind of like work ethic. It was like, if there's an opportunity, you take it, you don't say no, it doesn't matter if you don't have time. It doesn't matter if it's not even your area of expertise. Like you just take it because that might be the only opportunity you get, the only chance you get to show that like, hey, I'm here, um, you know, I'm, I want to do more, I want to be more. Um, and so for many years, I was just like running myself ragged because it's like, I, you have to say yes to everything, you know, and that that's the way you're going to go up in your career. Um, I think for me, it wasn't until I hit my 30s that I've said, you know what, like, one, I want to step back and I really want to be intentional about my career and not just take opportunities and promotions um, just because they're given to me. Like, do I really even want that thing? Is that really important to me? So it wasn't until I was in my 30s, well after I had my son, that I started to think more intentionally about things and start to say, it's okay to say no to stuff, that opportunities will still uh, make themselves present that I don't have to burn myself out to be successful. And honestly, like, what does success mean to me? And mm. that was a big shift because once I started to say, well, what does success actually look like to me? It was much easier to say no to things, to set boundaries around my schedule, um, both like when I start work, when I stop work. Um, and I think as a whole, it has made me a better manager. It's made mm. me a better uh, colleague because I bring those things forward with me when I engage with people and my expectations about what their boundaries and that the fact that they should have them and it's okay and I want to encourage them to, I bring that forward. And I think it's all because I had to go through that. I'm working myself, you know, 14 hours a day. I'm working on the weekends. I'm working at night. You know, I'm saying yes to every um committee every you know every advisory group like I'm like on everything and people are like this doesn't even have anything to do with IT and like Sharon's on that group it's like I was just saying <laughs> yes to everything with with no regard to my well-being or my happiness and yeah it was about my mid-30s where I started to think about some just internally what is important to me um, what is happiness what is success and then those things colored um, my approach to saying no and setting up boundaries. And Wes knows I'm really good with my boundaries. You know, when people <laughs> set boundaries, but then they people just walk over them. I'm really good. Like, my boundaries are set. And that's it. And that's all on that. <laughs> that sounds like another you? superpower. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. So full disclosure for folks listening or watching, I get the pleasure, the honor of working with Sharon on a regular basis <laughs> at UC Berkeley. And she kind of just gave me the alley-oop because I was about to go there. So, Sharon, you said when you hit your 30s, it's kind of when you had that moment to check in and say, you know what? I don't have to say yes to every single thing. I got other priorities. What's success to me? Can you talk a little bit about, like, what's that been like since then? Like, have you had to check back in? Do you think you've done a fairly good job in review? Because I'll tell you now, if I were to write the uh, opening speech for the Sharon Award <laughs> end of the year, and it was over the last two years, for the general person, me included, I would say, wow, she still did a whole lot of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And I, and, and I guess it's for everybody, it's different. 
So my Mm -hmm. level of production and my level of like what I'm engaged in, other people would be like, I'm at my max, like just looking at you. (laughs) But for me, this is, this is less, this is a much slower pace of life. Like I log off at five o'clock, you know, I, I don't work on the weekends. Yeah. I'm in security, so there is the rare occasion that there is a literal fire and someone is, um, we need to put them out. But other than that, I, um, I, I, like I said, I set my boundaries and I really focused on what I think is important, which for me is my family um, and my myself. Um, and then everything else comes after that. I can't give my organization, I can't give the groups and committees that I'm um, passionate about anything if I don't have anything. And so I really focus on that. But yes, I I do do a lot. Uh, I am involved in a lot of things, but they're all things that are important to me um, that I think are critical um, areas that I want to see movement in, particularly around uh, diversity and technology. Um, So I I save my energy for those things. And I set boundaries around other things that say you can only have so much because I need it for these other things. Yeah. But yeah, I'm, I, I do a lot of stuff. Thanks a lot, Wes, <laughs> for reminding me. So switching gears a little bit, Leslie, I'm curious, you know, from your lens, we just heard some really great strategies, of course, from yeah. Sharon. However, I'm thinking for you, since you've taken my place leading the YPAC now, and I know how much of a commitment <laughs> that alone is, let alone everything else that I know that you do at the University of Florida. How do you, you know, manage feeling overcommitted or, you know, saying yes to everything? How do you kind of establish those boundaries? And, you know, how do you manage the pressure? I don't know if I figured it out quite yet, if I'm being transparent. Like, I I do have moments where I'm like, yes, I am thinking about myself here and I'm doing what's right but there are so many moments where I really focus on I think people pleasing and wanting to be there for everyone around me so I I will say yes if I know it will help someone if it supports them and I along the way forget like what am I what am I saying yes to me for what am I giving myself because I have days where I'm not able to do, you know, some simple tasks that I would like to do to stay focused and, and be present. And we're not even talking about yet when I go home to my children and do the the other parts of my world. Um, So yeah, I, I do have moments where I feel like there's a lot because I'm trying to, like Sharon said, trying to prove myself, show I'm capable. Um, I think Young professionals, too, have so many layers of complexity to their identity at this point where not only you're trying to prove yourself, but you're um, you're balancing starting a family or maybe purchasing your first home. You're advocating and getting involved in social unrest in the world. And what can you do to make this place better? Because some days it stinks. Um, yeah. So like all of these layers of complexity that I think young professionals have to carry and then prove yourself and be present. Um, So for me personally, I do make sure I'm my own advocate. I talk to my supervisor and my check-ins and I'm very clear about where I need support or what's on my plate because if the people around me don't know what I'm handling, then it's just going to get worse. Yeah. Um, I also do a very young professional thing. I see this in memes all the time online that, oh, young, like millennials or Gen Z, they always have to treat themselves for everything. And I do. <laughs> At the end of every month, I treat myself to a book because like it was every month. It's like there's so much to do. And I want that book at the end of the month. So (laughs) for me, I (laughs) I do treat myself. That helps. Um, But yes, being your own advocate, I think is important. (laughs) Yeah, I love that. I'm just picturing you treating yourself to a book. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. I think I do it more than once a month, but that's the specific book (laughs) for making it through the month. 
That's a really good point, too, that you made about being your own advocate. And I really sense that also from you, too, Sharon, and what you're saying, just knowing how you define your success. So I'm curious if if y'all have any strategies or tactics to share with our listeners on how to be your your best advocate and perhaps how to define success. Like, what is the first step someone could take if they're trying to do that? What does that look like in practice for you? Leslie I, first, maybe. Okay. I just, I loved something that Sharon said earlier that was about like asking yourself what is important to you? Because if you are like, you're saying yes to everything and it's not meaningful to you. Um, I, I'm guilty of doing that in the past. I have like some FOMO too, fear of missing out where I think I better be involved in everything because you don't know what you're going to miss. Um, but I love this new concept called ROMO, which is relief <laughs> of missing out. Like you, you tell yourself it's okay to say no because you don't need to be involved in that. Um, but as far as like, I think like I said, speaking up to the people around you, um, even like writing out specifics of how much time you're investing in particular projects. And, you know, like I talk, I'm the chair of YPAC and that means nothing to some people at my university because they just don't know what's involved in that. And so I will say how many hours I'm contributing to this and what I'm planning to see in the future from this, what kind of support I need. So just being very clear. Mm. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with that, being really clear about what you're, what you got on your plate and what your bandwidth is. And when I say like what your bandwidth is, sometimes people, especially when it comes to work, they only think about their workload. They don't think about anything else. They don't think mm -hmm. about, I gotta, you know, volunteer at my kid's school. I need to um, have time to read that book that I'm gonna treat myself with at the end <laughs> of the month. You know, I need time to clean my house. So when I say bandwidth, like look at your, all of your bandwidth. Like what do you, what are you really working with? And then how much of that is for work? How much of that is for personal? And then for that work bucket, what can you really do with what you've got? You know what I mean? And be really brutally honest. It's, it's something that I ask all of my team members to do. It's a conversation that I have with leadership. Um, and I will be honest, I get a lot of uh, pushback about how real I am about like, what can we actually get done? I'm not the type of manager or leader that's going to lie and say, we can get this thing that's going to take us six months done in one month. No, <laughs> like I'm going to be honest. And I think we have to do that with ourselves too. And with all the things that we have to do. And then unfortunately we're adults, we have to make tough decisions. And sometimes we have to say, if I want to be able to be the chair of YPAC, I'm not going to be able to sit on these five other committees and that's just the way it is because YPAC is important to me. You know what I mean? And like, and that's yeah. an individual thing of really going through and thinking about it and being honest with ourselves. Because I think a, most of us want to be successful. We we want to do good work. You know, we want to excel. And so we put up pressure on our own selves to like go over and above and beyond consistently. It's okay to do it every now, but that constant grind is what wears us down mentally and physically. And so we have to be honest with ourselves sometimes and say, we're actually doing it to ourselves. No one's really, <laughs> they're yeah. not expecting that of us. They're not doing, they're going home and having Oops. dinner with their family. And they're like, why are you still online? And you're like, yeah, um, mm -hmm. I feel like I need to do all the things. Um, so yeah, I think just, it's so individual, but just really having those conversations with yourself, with your spouse or family, because you know, many of us are married or in partnerships and what they need is also important. So you might think, oh, I'm doing good. I'm balancing everything. I have good boundaries. And they might be like, no, like you are not spending enough of that pie um, here at home or with me. So yeah, it's so, it's, it's so personal, but it's also interesting to me because I love to see when people go from um, just working to like the epiphany of like, I get to decide, like, <laughs> what I do like it's like epiphany like I get to decide what I do at work 
like how much effort, how much energy, how much um, I give to, to, to this work thing. I heard I was um, listening to a women's panel and she's a professor at UC Merced. I believe her name is Dr. Martin. And she was talking about the whole idea of like work-life balance. And she said, I don't want my work life to balance with my personal life. Mm. She's like, mm. I, I, that's not what I want. I don't want it to have as much weight. I love um, that. So she talked more about like life flow. And I really <laughs> resonated with that because yes, I love my work. I, I love work. It's something that I enjoy doing. I enjoy you know, working with people, bringing them together, getting things done, bettering our university. But work is not as important to me as my life. And so I, I like that idea. And it's not a balance. It's a flow. So I'm, I'm curious. Uh, this is an open question for the, for the group. Listen to what everyone's saying. I'm thinking back to when I kind of first got into higher ed. So I'm early 20s, right? And mm -hmm. I remember some of the leaders that I had the pleasure of talking to and kind of asking them. Because like you mentioned, Sharon, I, I want to be successful too, just like most people. So I'm asking them, how did you get to your level or how did you get to your position? And I've heard similar feedback like, hey, you got to you know, take care of yourself, watch your energy. You got to take on the things that's going to bring you at, you know, add something to you. But you, that means you have to turn down some things to balance all that. But then on the flip side, as a young professional with very little context of what that means. Right. How do you how what are some thoughts on on this and that you say that? But then when I ask you or anyone here, like, hey, what do you do? I have two YPAC chairs. I, I have one person I know specifically that's in, been in 20 things. So, like, from the outside, look at me. you're doing a lot more than I'm doing right now. That's why we're here. We need right? therapy. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's your answer. We're, we're sure, doing our right own here. therapy. What I to say, because I think this is important, because I think some people will look at me and say, oh, Sean, you're very successful in your career, like the, the actual work you do, like you have a good job at a good university, but I got here by focusing on things that were important to me that were not tech related. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. if you look at the things that I am engaged in, for the most part, there are things that are on the administrative side of the house, things around diversity, things around equity, things about staff advocacy, and so, yes, I'm involved in a lot of things, but they're not always technology things. And yet I've still been able to leverage those things to then be successful in my career. So, again, I think it's that what is important to you and realizing that just because someone has a certain path and they're like, I'm, you know, I'm on the architecture review board, you know, I sit on this technology, you know, work group, this, and that's their path to success doesn't mean that that has to be your path to success and that you can still get to, again, what you have to find a success for yourself through other means. And so I think that's important to note because sometimes people are like, sometimes people, um, confuse me with the diversity, um, you know, they're like, oh, you're like a vice chancellor of diversity and equity. And I'm like, um, I run security. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know what I mean? So it's like, I, yeah. I, I decided what was important to me and I put all of my energy and my focus into that. And then I was able to leverage that to then also be successful in my career because those relationships come in really handy when you got to do tech stuff on mm -hmm. any of this. Yeah. Yeah. That's such a good point. I do feel like when I think back to the successes I've had so far in my career, it's always around things that I get so excited and passionate about. Like I, I've helped develop a service in our office that was based on some of my prior experience in the advising world, but now in instructional design. And I was so invested in it because this was like, I knew it was going to make an impact here. I knew it would help advisors and uh, student learning here. And I just, I got so into it that obviously it went well because I was fully invested. I was motivated. Um, but there are days too where I'm completely demotivated by factors that are out of my control. Like I live in the state of Florida where the politics aren't always great and it impacts higher education in ways that I'm not allowed to really 
fix. Um, but it can it can be tough to come in some days when you feel like a lot of things are out of your control. So I will I guess I would tell young professionals if you can channel your energy into the things that excite you and and you're passionate about, then success is bound to come your way, and that there will be moments where you do feel demotivated, and that's normal. The next Thank question you. is, can you share a personal experience where you felt pres- pressure to conform or fit into a professional environment as a young professional? And then a follow-up is, how, do you, how did you handle that pressure while staying true to yourself and your values? I have an answer, but if you want to go first, Sharon. No, go right ahead. Oh, okay. We, we want to hear both. So. <laughs> yeah. <Okay. laughs> um, I, I felt this a lot in my first higher ed professional job. I was working in a college of business and I would attend meetings where um, a lot of the people at the table didn't look anything like me. They were older men who all looked the same. They all kind of dressed the same. And I, there was a lot of business etiquette and expectations in that role as well that just isn't like who I am. And I found myself at the time I was Leslie Martinez and they could never remember my name, which it felt like a simple enough name. But I also was afraid to speak up in that role because I wasn't around anyone who I thought could relate to me or looked like me. Um, And I remember a professor, I was in graduate school at the time, he asked in class that night when I was in one of those meetings, how do we, how do we come to higher ed and work through group dynamics and make sure that all the voices are included? Like how, tell us about how you speak up. And I said, I don't speak up. I'm too afraid. I am, I'm afraid to say anything because I don't think they even want to hear from me. No one ever asks. And I don't think it's my job to be the one to say, hey, I need to say something because I'm kind of, I was terrified if I'm being honest. So um, I now am in an office where the people all come from different backgrounds and have different perspectives and we can all truly be ourselves because none of us are alike. Like we get to just decide who is Leslie and they deal with it. Um, (laughs) So I I feel so fortunate to be in a place now where diversity of thought is, at least within our office, it's respected and that all voices are included. And I feel a lot more like myself. I don't know if that really addressed the question, but. (laughs) No, that's beautiful. I think it did. Yeah. 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 Okay, good. Thank you. I just I just want to chime in quickly and say I really appreciate how you're being so honest in in saying that you were afraid to speak up, right? I think many of us, especially young professionals, when we're new, when we don't have a lot of experience, especially if we haven't been able to be around more senior staff, you know, we can feel very isolated and we can also just feel very intimidated, right? We can feel this weight of you know, everyone's knowledge and everyone knowing so much in the room and I know nothing Mm -hmm. when, you know, I think for all of us here, (laughs) I'm laughing because I've had this conversation with Leslie a little bit too, but I think all of us here as we've gotten older have realized as we've gone to different institutions, sat at different tables, been a part of different committees, I think it, one of the biggest shocks of my professional life has been learning that people who I thought knew everything may actually not know everything yes oh it's the best (laughs) thing to figure that out (laughs) you know it was such like a relieving thing at first horrifying because i had put so much like (laughs) expectations and you know frankly i put a lot of of my former leaders even on pedestals right thinking that they just knew everything and if all else failed so and so could just swoop in and rescue us and they know it all and you know what a limiting perspective to have, both for yourself and for that person or persons mm-hmm. whom you're, you know, expecting the world out of. Um, you know, we're all humans at the end of the day, and it's just been one of the most liberating things to learn. And why I'm sharing this and saying this to our young professional audience and everyone really is: we don't know everything. No one will know everything, and it's okay. <laughs> and we can just kind of take some of that pressure off of ourselves. 
And, you know, to your point earlier, Sharon, I think we put so much pressure on ourselves and we tell ourselves these kind of crazy narratives too, right? And I think if we don't check ourselves and we don't talk about it, we can just get really stuck and it can be very limiting and actually backfire on our careers when we're trying to work so hard to do everything. If we keep thinking that, you know, I'm not enough or everyone else knows everything or even the converse, I know everything and there's nothing to learn. Either way, either extreme, I think, is one of the most limiting mindsets to have. Okay, I'll get off my soapbox now. <laughs> one, one more quick thing. Sharon made a great point earlier that the, you reach a point in your career where you're like, oh, I get to make some decisions here on what's important to me. That's a turning point. And the other turning point for me was just that where I'm like, oh, these are all humans. <laughs> Like, nobody here is a perfected robot that knows everything, you know? Like, we all have things that we need to work on. And yeah. that that helps me speak up a bit more because I realize that. Yeah. yeah. We that, get to create culture. You know, we get yeah. to create a culture um, of who gets to speak up and who feels comfortable to speak up. You know, that's like something that I actively been working on at all the organizations that I am, that people understand that, like you said, we all work here. We're all humans. And if you're in that room, you have the right to be there and your voice yeah. matters. It doesn't matter what your title is. And you should feel comfortable to raise your hand and say, hey, I have a thought about what's being discussed from the perspective of the expertise that I'm bringing to the table. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's like something that we have to actively engage in and work on of creating that space in all the departments, all the meetings, um, because otherwise we do miss out. We miss out on critical, important information and sites if we're saying, oh, okay, if you have this title and below, you just sit here and be quiet and, and you don't get to participate like that. That's going to mean that we're doing um, less innovative, less thoughtful uh, work because we're not including all the voices that would help us in that. So, yeah, it's right. really, truly important. And then here right. I come, because if you ask my mother, I have always thought that my opinion was important <laughs> and that everybody needed to hear it. So, so, so. I never had that issue. I, I'm going to say what I'm going to say to who I'm going to say it to. And it's amazing. Listen, what's is often like, Shawnee, you want to close the door? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <laughs> what I have to say, I'm going to say the same thing to them that I'm you in this room. Um, so it's really, it, it, I it's saw so his face. <laughs> he says it all. I'll just be talking. He's like, try to even close the door. <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm like, oh, okay. Yeah, sure. Whatever. <laughs> but yeah, so I've always been that person. And so when I started my career, I didn't really have that like, oh, I'm, you know, afraid to speak or anything like that. But I recognize that that is not everyone's um, situation. And I, um, through my career, I've always told other people, like, if you are afraid to talk or if you don't want to say that thing because you're worried about blowback, like, tell me because, you know, I'll say it like so I'm like, <laughs> OK, if, we have to support each other in that. Um, but I did have a very interesting. So I worked in private industry um, and I worked um, in clinical. So I, I did. I never thought I was going to be in technology. This, this was not the career that of my mm -hmm. choosing it just happened. Again, because you take the opportunities, whatever comes, and it happened to be tech. Nice. Um, but when I moved from private industry into higher education, I remember very early on, probably like within like maybe two or three months, I got invited to a meeting and there were some senior level folks in there. And at the time I was an analyst. And again, me being who I am, I'm like, if I'm in the room, they must want to hear what I have to say about these things. So they're talking and I'm talking and I'm, you know, giving my input and my thoughts. And I remember one of the, the, the men in the room, again, I'm a black woman in tech, higher ed. So there were no black people in the room. There definitely weren't any black women. And I think there might've been one other woman um, in the room total. So, um, and I remember him saying to me, like, basically like, you're not supposed to talk. Like, you're just here to like, be quiet and take notes and I said I get a paycheck just like you get a paycheck 
And if I got invited to the meeting, there must be something that I know that you don't know. And everybody was kind of, it was like all the- You are so the, cool. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> and everybody was just like- Oh, that's it's amazing. Been, <laughs> the meeting continued and I continued to get invited to that meeting. So for me, that was like, okay, I'd like, and I've, I've approached my career that way, but I think even more importantly, I have approached how I manage people that way. Mm. I tell all of my people, if you are there, you have the absolute right to speak up. And actually, I expect you to speak up. You're hired because of your expertise. If you don't tell them, how will they know? Then they'll make bad decisions. They still may make bad decisions, but that's a whole other conversation. But <laughs> That's another <laughs> podcast episode. Power <laughs> people. Yeah, exactly. And, and again, change our culture of about who who has a voice and who's important and who gets to, to chime in. Um, so I, for me less about me and more about what then I can do for other people in those who are afraid or who are worried or think that they might get in trouble or not get invited back. It's like, no. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's an important point too, that like, it's not just on young professionals, but their supervisors and leaders to make it explicit and transparent that you matter. You're here for a reason. We're here to support you. And that same can apply to finding that balance in your work. It's not like if you struggle with saying no, it's good to have leadership around you too that can recognize like, how can we find balance and support you? So good right. reminder for all of us. Indeed. Yes. <laughs> so we're getting kind of close to the top of the hour, but there's one thing I want to sneak in here, um, pulling another nugget from the study I referenced earlier. Um, when I was reading that, another comment was about young professionals speaking up and how young professionals more than any demographic right now ask a lot of questions, specifically the question, why? And I think I know most folks here in this call, and we all ask questions. We all ask why. And, you know, I think kind of back to your point, Sharon, I think sometimes when, you know, young folks come into the workplace and we're asking these questions, why it can be perceived, you know, as a negative, as why are you questioning us? And it can put folks on the defensive. Um, however, when I was reading the study, it really was focusing on how much young people really need to understand the why behind things. They really need to see how what we're doing links up to the big picture, what their role is in it, so that they know how they can effectively navigate the organization, um, know how to speak up, when to speak up, know how they can be effective in meetings, all of those things. So I'm bringing this up, one, as kind of like a, a tangent to what you were saying, Sharon, because I think it's really important for folks everyone listening, not only young professionals, but the leaders and managers of young professionals and of organizations to know that your young folks are asking these questions and it's for the greater good. It's with good intention. It's with a lens of curiosity, as Leslie referenced her superpower was at the beginning <laughs> of the show. I mean, that just underscores it so much is that we're curious and we're not asking questions to elicit you know, any wrongdoing or anything like that. It's truly because we're curious and we're hungry for knowledge and wanting to learn. So with that being said, a kind of flip side to that is I think young professionals are very, very much pressured to be the ones who know all the technology things or know the new thing, right? If something's wrong with one of your colleagues' computers, you're typically called over to go fix it, right? That's kind of a, you know, a stereotype and I think something that can really pigeonhole us as young professionals. So I'm curious, kind of given, you know, both of these sides uh you know of this lens to look at this through with young professionals being curious and asking questions but also being expected to kind of understand all the new technology and ai right now like how do you handle that pressure and are you being asked at your institutions right now hey what should we do about this what should we do about that ai right leslie i'm looking at you <laughs> specifically yeah, because i know you work yeah right right but i'm curious for both of you to share kind of and even west too all of us here like how are you handling that that pressure and that expectation to deliver i maybe this is the wrong answer but i don't feel a lot of pressure in this area because technology changes like every day so 
I might make a recommendation one day around like AI and teaching and learning and showing what we can do. And then the next day there are new restrictions or new capabilities. And I think you've got, if you're working in IT, you have to have the mindset that things constantly change and you can depend on that and that you are open to learning and figuring it out and being clear to the people you support that like we are, we're exploring this and I can get back with you and I, I you know, test it more. But um, yeah, I think also another thing that you've, Sarah, you've seen us do in our office is we do fun trainings around technology to encourage faculty and staff to, to use it. Um, so I think that's an important factor too, honestly, is fun. Like we will do yeah. these cooking shows to show faculty how you can take AI prompts like recipes and plug it in and build activities and things like that and it becomes approachable and people are more apt I think to ask questions because they know like oh these people you know they're approachable we can talk about it they're they're having fun um so yeah I don't know I just I can rely on change so it's not too much pressure for me but maybe I'll feel differently <laughs> <laughs> or maybe you're managing it very well. <laughs> or maybe I'm forgetting something. <laughs> <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> yeah, I think um, getting comfortable with the level of ambiguity because mm -hmm. things are changing so constantly. Something I talk to my managers about a lot. So right now we're in budget season and one of my managers is like he wants to know all the numbers, like all the things, like for perpetuity. And I'm like, we're never gonna have that level of information. We're not gonna know what, it's just not possible. And you have to get comfortable with making decisions about things that you don't have all the information on. And, but still trying to make the best decision that's possible with what you do know and what you think is gonna come into the future. And so I think um, particularly in higher education technology is like, we have a lot of leaders who are not comfortable with ambiguity and it makes it very difficult for them to make decisions. Um, and so I think that's where you get some of the like, well, why are you questioning it? Because they don't have the answers and they're uncomfortable about that. So then when you're asking them stuff, then it's like, don't ask me that because now I have to think about all the things that I don't know and the decisions that I'm having to make in the in the lack of those answers. Um, but I think it's important for everyone, not just young professionals, but everyone to be asking questions and really looking at our processes and understanding the, 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 the whys and the hows before we make decisions about technology. That's one of my biggest, like, pet peeves is we just throw technology at things and we don't even understand like what the business processes are or why someone's doing what they're doing or what their pain points are. And then we're surprised when the technology doesn't fix the issue, but it exacerbates the issue. So I'm like all for, again, creating cultures where people can ask questions that there is time to actually do evaluations and analysis of things before we start buying things or talking about buying things or implementing things so yeah I, I i love the the idea of like more inquisitiveness and and more discussions um but not discussion paralysis where you never get past that that's what, again a whole other <laughs> another podcast will invite you invite back for yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah, and I don't know about the whole, like, you know, um, young professionals being kind of pigeonholed into, like, they know everything and they can fix everything. I feel like that's, like, a technology thing. It's, like, once you say, I work in technology, then it's, mm -hmm. like, can you fix my printer? Can you, you know, set up my oh, Wi-Fi? I get texts all the time from my mom. No, I can't. <laughs> <laughs> I too am struggling with my life. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I feel like that's like a tech thing. It's like people mm -hmm. just think, you know, I, I remember I used to go to the hospital um, and at the time I was working enterprise apps and all the doctors would be like, can you fix our, um, our label printer? And I'm like, no, no, but I can call the other <laughs> tech people and they can come fix your label printer. I don't know what to do now. <laughs> 
But yeah, I think they just think your technology so you know. I mean, it just gets exacerbated in house where it's like you're young. You, um, I was listening to your podcast actually yesterday on the ride in, and some I can't remember the episode or the name of the person. Sorry, I'll blame that on old age Gen X. Um, but she mentioned <laughs> like every time they wanted to do some kind of student interfacing or student facing, they pegged her because she was the young professional and she was like, I'm 40. Like that was Kate. Yeah. Okay. Wow. And then I feel like it's the same thing. You know what I mean? It's like, I'm young, but I'm not that young, you know? Yeah. And it's like that interesting um, dynamic of how maybe some older folks view younger people in the institution and, and don't make that distinction of like, they're not 18, you know, they're not right. 20. These are seasoned right. professionals. Yeah, we're millennials. At least I am. We're we have houses. We live in the suburbs. We have kids. We have right. minivans. We're yeah. old. Like <laughs> we're not eighteen. I guess I should frame it that way. We're not children. Yes, like we have our own children at this yeah. point. Because it's like that whole thing is like, okay, if you're not fifty plus, you must be a kid. And it's like, no, mm. there's degrees in here that we need to yes. consider. Yes. <laughs> yes. And I think we also just had our first full circle moment where one of our guests on our podcast reference one of our earlier episodes of listening to our podcast so i just want to celebrate that thank you we made it <laughs> oh well i know we're at the top of the hour folks so this has been just an incredible conversation thank you both leslie and sharon so much for being here for sharing your wisdom and knowledge yes we will invite you to future episodes please <laughs> thank you for oh. having us <laughs> of course, of course. So before we close out, I want to invite my co-host Wes uh, to say any final words. Sure. So I want to call back to something. This is how I'm going to close it out this time. So Leslie mentioned that no one knows everything, which made me think, <laughs> what would your life be like if you did, if you were the one who knew everything? And the closest thing I could think of was Google. And Google, <laughs> Google processes 8.5 billion searches daily. So if you truly wow. know everything... Imagine a life of taking in and responding to somewhere around 8 billion questions a day. Oh, I don't your think headaches. I want to know everything. <laughs> that sounds like a great life. Got to set about what you're going to answer and not answer. Boundaries. Yes. <laughs> to, to know it and to not answer. That was 8 billion times. That's a lot of oh boundaries. <laughs> like, that's a lot of <laughs> an amazing fact that we learned today thank you Wes <laughs> yes thank you Wes <laughs> yes so well, I'm grateful that. that I'm still learning oh sorry go ahead Sarah. oh go ahead no please <laughs> no just I'm grateful that you will never know everything and that's what I think keeps us going you know yeah. exactly <laughs> the guess the pursuit of knowledge which is why we're all here and why we're really excited for some upcoming podcast episodes as well so Thank you all so much for this incredible discussion today. We look forward to having you back on the show again. Thank you for listening. And for all of our listeners, thank you for listening as well. Uh, you can follow us on the Educause platform or wherever you get your podcasts. This is the Educause Rising Voices podcast. Thank you. Thank you.